Grace. Okay. Um, do you want to introduce, and then I'll do introduce the lecture. Yeah. Um, so I'll introduce as I can. Yeah. Because that way I can tell everyone about the questions. Okay. Sure. And I'll do it. Sounds good. Should I get out of the way, or am I okay here? Fine. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final lecture of this year's fall seminar series with Science in the News. For those of you who are new to the lectures and to our organization, uh, we are Science in the News, a graduate student organization focused on communicating science to you, the general public. Um, I'm Tammy, and this is Amy, and together we are co-directors of Science in the News. In addition to this lecture series, which Amy is going to tell you a little more about, we have a couple other programs that run throughout the year. Um, one of those is Science by the Pint. Science by the Pint is, our, is a different style event where we bring a group of scientists to a local bar. Right now we're at the Burren in Davis Square. And the scientist, it'll usually be a faculty member and their lab of graduate students and postdocs. All of the scientists spend most of the night mingling from table to table and sitting down, chatting with the people there about their work, whatever questions you might have. There is a very short introduction, but it is short, and there are no slides. The focus is on sitting down and talking with you. Additionally, we have a written, uh, written newsletter that comes out every two weeks and is posted on our webpage. This newsletter gets sent out to our entire email listserv, so if you're not on there, you can join it simply by filling out your email address at the bottom of your surveys. This brings me to a very important point. You should have picked up a survey as you came in tonight. We use these surveys for a number of things. One is to improve our programming. Two is to provide, speak, provide feedback to the individual speakers. So we really ask you to hold on to it until the end so you can give any feedback to all three of our lecturers tonight. And finally, we use this to provide information to our funding sources about who's coming to our lectures and how many people. So even if you don't have any strong opinions, please fill it out just so we have a good count. Um, our final program that we do here at Science in the News is we have a school outreach program where we enter the classroom in a number of ways. And if you're interested in our school outreach program, you can come down and talk to either Amy or me at the break. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Amy to give you a little more information on how we'll run tonight's seminar. Hi, everyone, and thanks for coming to tonight's seminar on personalized medication or personalized medicine. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with our lecture format, each lecture consists of three parts, with each part presented by a different graduate student or postdoc. Um, so the first two parts are done, uh, and then a break, and then we have the third and concluding part of the lecture. Uh, during each of them, there will be several pauses for questions, and so uh, please ask all your questions then. Um, but we are a little bit constrained for time sometimes, so if we don't get to your question, uh, take advantage of the break and also after the lecture um, in order to ask your questions individually to the speakers then. Um, so sometimes there are some people who have like a whole lot of questions, and um, what we'll try to do tonight is, um, if you've already asked some questions, uh, save your additional questions uh, for those breaks, and um, the speakers might make a pause to see if anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet um, has one, and they'll put up their hand. Um, after the lecture, there will be a lab tour, so just stick around for about 10 minutes after the lecture, uh, and then we'll announce uh, that the lab tour is leaving. So I'd like to take this chance to uh, thank our sponsors. We're a graduate student organization of uh, Harvard's um, Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And so we're funded by the Graduate Student Council, um, Harvard's bookstore, The Coop, and also Harvard's medical school, especially the, the Division of Medical Sciences, and their Office of Communication and External Affairs. Um, and uh, finally, we're funded by the Biomedical Graduate Student Organization. Now, before we get started with tonight's lecture, we also have a spring lecture series, which will be getting started in April on Harvard's Cambridge campus. And to tell you about the first lecture, we have our first speaker of the spring lecture series, Marshall, to tell you about that lecture. Thanks so much, guys. Um, I'm going to be really brief here, because I know you're all excited to hear about personalized medicine. Um, but Basically, uh, my lecture is about cell death, which is an incredible and amazing process. And I'm going to walk you through the process of cell death and give you a little bit of information about the details of this process, why it's so interesting, and what we're doing to study cell death. So I'm going to give you three reasons to come to my lecture on April 17th at the Cambridge campus. 
You can check our website for more information about it as the event arrives. The three reasons are, first of all, cell death is an incredibly important process. Um, every cell in your bodies now is endowed with the potential to execute the cell death program, and it's incredibly important for healthy maintenance of most multicellular organisms, such as ourselves. It's important for controlling things like cancer. You guys can go through. Go ahead. You're not interrupting me. It's very important for controlling things like cancer. Um, cell death pathways are very commonly mutated in cancer. And it's also very important for controlling infection. The immune system uses cell death to its advantage to keep us healthy. The second reason to come to my lecture is that cell death is incredibly cool. And when I say it's incredibly cool, I mean it is one of the most amazing natural wonders that I have ever encountered. Some of you might be computer scientists or engineers or might have an interest in those things. This is an example of a natural switch and a natural program. When cells encounter stresses, such as an environmental toxin, they have to make a decision between living and dying. And when they make that decision to die, it's just like flipping a switch. It's irreversible and it's incredibly robust. And when that switch has been flipped, there is a program that is executed that is um, incredibly intricate, very interesting and complex. So the second reason, the geeky reason, is that it's a natural wonder. And the third reason, and the most important reason, is that I work on it. So you have to come and listen to hear me talk about uh, the work that's done in my lab and uh, the, work, um, the work that I do specifically, which is sort of about understanding the nuts and bolts of the cell death program. And then other people in the lab that I study in, which is right up the hall here, work on understanding how the immune system uses cell death to keep us healthy. So um, I think with that, I'm going to hand it over to the lecturers. But before I do, I want to say um, we should all thank Tammy Slen, who's here tonight. She has been co-director for two years, and I think this is her last lecture. Is that right? So thanks so much for all of your amazing work, Tammy. Thank you. And now that Marshall has given me my round of applause, I have one final request for you. Please take out and silence your cell phones before we get started. Um, we are streaming these talks live, so you don't want people across the country hearing your ring. And we also do film the lectures for future viewing uh, and edit those so you can watch them again. So please silence your cell phones. And as Marshall alluded to, the spring lecture series will follow a slightly new format. Um, there'll be single speaker lectures focused more on one very detailed topic of their research. So we hope you'll check us out again in the spring. But for now, I hope you enjoy tonight's talk by three graduate students here at Harvard Medical School, for starting with Adriana. All right, can you guys hear me OK? All right. So my name is Adriana San Roman. I'm a fourth year graduate student in the biological and biomedical sciences program here at Harvard. And today, along with my fellow graduate students, Claire and Leah, right over here, um, we'll be talking to you about whole genome sequencing and its impact on personalized medicine. Now, this is a topic I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about in the news recently. Um, and this is largely because there have been some major technological advances in the past few years, and the cost of genome sequencing is dramatically decreasing making this a feasible option to be used um, in medicine in the future. Um, so uh, tonight we're just going to start off with our definition of personalized medicine. So this is the tailoring of medical care based on the genetic characteristics of each individual patient. And so in this picture, uh, you can see a doctor examining a young patient. Uh, and traditionally, when you've been to the doctor, you've experienced this. The doctor will examine any symptoms you have. Um, but we think that in the future, the doctor will have some of your genetic information in the back of her mind when she's making a diagnosis. And this genetic information is encoded in your DNA. And so we'll talk a little bit more about this later. So I just wanted to start off with a story. So this is the story of Nicholas Volker. Um, and this is an example of a time when DNA sequencing and personalized medicine was actually able to help diagnose and treat this boy's disease. Um, so when Nicholas was a little bit over one, years, um, one year old, 
he um, presented with some unusual symptoms affecting his bowel. Um, doctors were really puzzled as to what this was. Um, so to try and figure it out, he had to endure over 100 surgeries um, to try and diagnose and potentially treat his symptoms. Unfortunately, um, none of these actually worked, and they did not find any diagnosis or treatment. Um, and so this process went on for about three years before doctors decided it might be worth trying to look at his genetic sequence uh, to figure out what was actually causing his symptoms. So we'll hear more about this uh, later in Claire and Leah's talk. So stay tuned. Um, this was in 2000, 2008. Um, and if you look at the glossary we have, there's a link to a bunch of um, news articles about this story. So you can check that out at home. So tonight's talk, um, first I'll be talking about what is DNA and how does DNA sequencing work. Then Claire will tell us about how DNA sequencing can improve diagnosis and prevent disease. And then finally, Leah will tell us about how personalized medicine can help us find better treatments. Okay, so for my part of the talk, um, we'll divide it into three parts, and I'll stop for questions um, between each one. So first, we'll talk about what is DNA and why is it important. Um, now, some of you who attend our lectures regularly may find this part um, to be a little bit repetitive with what you've heard in previous lectures. Um, but we want to make sure everyone's on the same page, so we'll just quickly review it again. Um, the second part of the talk, we'll um, consider what are the consequences of an alteration in our DNA sequence. And then finally, we'll talk about how DNA sequencing actually works. Okay, so we'll just start out with DNA. So you can think about DNA as the instruction manual for life. It contains all of the information we need to um, produce all of the um, functions in our body. So um, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and a schematic um, of DNA is on the right-hand side of the screen, and we'll come back to that later. DNA is found in our cells, um, and all of our genetic information is actually found in all of these cells. So, one um, tough thing that a cell needs to do is decide which parts of the DNA it's actually going to um, read to tell it what to do. For example, a cell in our brain is going to need some different instructions than a cell in our digestive system. Um, so how does that actually happen? How do cells only choose specific parts of DNA uh, to read? Well, um, DNA is divided up into genes. So you can think about these like chapters of our instruction manual. And a gene is just a short piece of DNA that's going to tell your cell how to make one cellular machine, um, what we refer to as proteins. Um, and now it's going to be really important to think about how we go from DNA to proteins. Um, so I just have these mysterious arrows here right now, but we'll talk about that um, a little more at the end of this section. But first, let's um, think a little bit more about DNA itself. So one interesting thing is that not all of our DNA encodes for proteins. Um, so here I have a short piece of DNA where we might have two genes present. But um, there's this area of DNA in the middle here um, which does not encode for a protein. So this is called non-coding DNA or you may have heard it referred to in the news as junk DNA. Um, it was referred to as junk DNA by scientists for a long time because we didn't actually know what function it had. Um, but now we're actually learning a lot more about it, and it turns out that it does have some very important functions, such as telling our cells how much protein product from each of the genes to make, and likely has a lot of other functions that we haven't even discovered yet. Um, and so it's really important to think about all the different parts of DNA because actually less than 2% of our DNA actually encodes for a protein. So most of our DNA is this, quote, junk DNA. Um, so it will be important to think about this in the different types of sequencing we can do, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more in Claire's talk. 
Um, so DNA is made up of building blocks called nucleotides. And there are four different types of nucleotides represented here by the four letters A, T, G, and C. Um, and so here's a schematic on the left of DNA. It's a double-stranded molecule, so you can see each of these ribbons represent one strand. And between the strands, we have our nucleotides sticking out. Um, and these nucleotides are pairing with one another to, to hold the strands together. There's a very specific way that they pair. A always pairs with T, and G always pairs with C. So this is very important to know because when we're talking about a genetic sequence, we mean that we're trying to figure out the actual order of the A's, T's, G's, and C's in our DNA. And this is a really hard task when you think about how big the human genome is. Um, the human genome is made of three billion pairs of nucleotides. Um, so you can appreciate the scope of this problem of trying to sequence DNA. Okay, so let's go back to how do we make a protein from um, DNA. So we'll just go through this in an animated form uh, to illustrate the point. So we'll start out with our DNA. Um, so this, it, we're going to represent a gene just with this short strand of DNA. Um, this is much shorter than a gene you would find in the body. An average gene is about 3,000 nucleotides long. Um, but just for illustrative purposes, we'll use this short strand. Um, and then the cell makes a photocopy of this DNA, uh, and the photocopy is called the RNA message. RNA is a very similar molecule to DNA, um, except it replaces the nucleotide T with U. Once the message is made, um, we can now make our protein or cellular machine. The cell reads the message in three nucleotide increments to make one building block of a protein called an amino acid. So in this case, we have AUU encoding for an orange square. So the cell goes along in three nucleotide increments to um, make the rest of the amino acids that are going to be in the specific protein encoded by this gene. Okay. So we've just seen how DNA can make a protein um, based on the sequence that's encoded um, in the uh, DNA. So does anyone have any questions at this point? OK. Great. You guys are all with me. OK. Um, so next we'll talk about what are the consequences of an alteration in the DNA sequence. So some changes in our DNA can result in abnormal proteins, which can cause disease. And there are many different ways um, we can alter our DNA um, to make an abnormal protein. So sometimes these changes are inherited. So for example, some genetic diseases can be passed down to us um, from our parents as we get one copy of each gene from our mother and one from our father. Um, additionally, we need to replicate our cells during our lives, and sometimes mistakes can be made during that process. And finally, sometimes exposure to a damaging agent, such as UV light or smoking, can also damage our DNA. OK, so sometimes accidental changes in DNA sequence can be bad. So we're going to look at an example of this now. So let's say we have our normal DNA sequence here. And there's some sort of insult that happens to our DNA that results in a change from a G to a C. And this is called our mutated DNA. And a mutation is an accidental permanent change in our DNA sequence. Um, so what kind of impact would a mutated DNA actually have on a protein that's going to be made from this DNA? So here we have our diagram, um, which we just talked about earlier, of our normal gene um, resulting in our normal protein. So if now we have our mutated gene here, when we make our message um, or our photocopy of that gene, that mutation is going to get carried along. So now you can imagine when we're reading the code, 
Um, whereas we used to have GCA, which encodes for a um, green circle, we now have CCA resulting in this yellow diamond. Um, and changing the amino acid that's in that protein could potentially have pretty severe consequences for that protein's function, um, meaning that sometimes the protein can't even function at all. Um, and you might think that a one base pair change, uh, you know, doesn't seem very significant, it can't mean very much, but actually there are many diseases that are caused by a single base pair change, or a single nucleotide change. And one example is sickle cell anemia. This is a blood disorder in which there is a mutation in the gene for hemoglobin. And this is a protein um, that we need for carrying oxygen in our blood. Um, and this one nucleotide change um, can really cause a pretty devastating disease in this case. Okay, so we talked about how changes in your DNA sequence can have some pretty devastating effects, but actually not all changes have to result in an abnormal or altered protein. So here's an example where we now have a mutation over here. So we used to have a G in this location and now we have an A. So again, when we make our message, we're going to carry along that mutation. And then when we go to make our protein, we're going to read the code. And in this case, we were able to make the same amino acid from both the UUG and the UUA code. So this is possible because the code is actually redundant. So UUG and UUA are coding for the same amino acid. Um, and this is because we have more three-letter combinations than we have amino acids. So actually many of our amino acids are encoded by um, several of these three nucleotide um, codes. So this kind of a mutation is called a silent mutation. And this is because although there is a change in the DNA sequence, we don't see a change in the protein. So this is not likely to impact um, health and disease in any way. And actually, some differences in our DNA sequence is good. It's what helps make us different from one another. Um, so these kinds of single pa base pair differences that we find in three different individuals could contribute to variation within our population, as long as they're not interfering with a very important protein uh, that's going to disrupt a biological function. So we've been looking a lot at these single base pair changes, so I just wanted to bring up a term which will be useful to know when discussing uh, some of the sequencing that we're using, uh, that's being used currently in the clinic. So um, the term is single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, or we call these SNPs. Um, and so this is just a one nucleotide difference in the DNA sequence in a patient sample or in any DNA sample compared to a reference genome. So the reference genome was put together by scientists to kind of create what we would consider the normal genome. Um, this was made by compiling the genomes of several anonymous donors um, to try and avoid any areas that might contribute to disease. Obviously, we don't know all of the areas that contribute to disease, um, so I think we have a lot more to learn about the reference genome itself. But we need some way to figure out whether our changes are different, um, are potentially causing a disease. So um, we use this reference genome. Okay, so the biggest challenge of sequencing is figuring out which DNA changes are bad. So we said some of them can be good, some of them might have no effect, um, and it's not very obvious just by looking at the DNA. And so this is something that scientists are going to have to work on in the coming years as DNA sequencing becomes um, more common. Okay. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay. One here. Yeah. If, if you have a bad copy of a patient, is it more likely to then mutate it again than the next copy? Or is there any chance of that? Um, generally, you'd probably just carry it along. So in terms of um, a mutation that arises from faulty DNA replication, those are fairly rare um, and wouldn't likely happen in the same area again. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's probably, yeah. Um, if someone, if someone has a 
someone has a silent mutation, and let's say they're a fine, healthy adult, and can be a healthy adult, and then after they reach a certain age, suddenly a bad gene turns itself on and affects the rest of the body. Why does that happen if they carry, you know, someone else carried this, this gene? If, like it's a hereditary thing. How come it just can turn itself on in adult mode, like say mitochondrial disease or something? Hmm. I'm not exactly sure about that disease, um, but it's possible that there are some genes that are more important to you. Oh, um, so I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the question was, um, how come some genes or some mutations might manifest themselves later in life rather than earlier? Is that, yeah. Um, so I think it's just based on aging. Um, so we might need some of these products more later on than we do earlier, and also during aging, some of our biological processes fail. So if you have these sort of backup mechanisms that used to be in place but aren't anymore when you age, sometimes you can sort of uncover these um, issues. But I'm not exactly sure. We can talk more later. <laughs> sure. The reference phenol, could you please repeat which page? The reference phenol, is it necessarily from dense population? Um, so, they were chosen as sort of healthy people, but um, obviously we don't know everything. Oh, sorry. Um, was the reference genome chosen from healthy people? Um, so, yes. So these people were specifically chosen to not have any sort of disease risk variations, but we obviously don't know everything about that yet. So um, it's a little bit hard to say, and I'm sure it will be refined as time goes on. And maybe. Maybe one more. Sorry, you've had your hand up for a while. Just with, you know, say sickle cell or, or any other of these, you know, you know diseases, is there, is there usually a specific site that's being altered, you know, or, or is there a constellation of alterations that, you know, you know manifest themselves in different degrees and variations yeah. of the disease? Yeah. Um, so the question was, in um, some of these genetic diseases, such as sickle cell, is it always one base pair that gets changed, or can it be several different base pairs um, in different people? Uh, and the answer is kind of both. So for some diseases, we do see that it's one specific area that um, if you have a mutation there, you will be more likely to get the disease because maybe that part encodes an amino acid very important for that protein's function, whereas another part of the protein wasn't so important. Um, so we do see that. but. Um, there are cases where people have several different types of mutations as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll move on, um, but we can talk at the break if you have more questions. Okay. So the final part is uh, to, to, to discuss how does DNA sequencing actually work. So we'll just talk a little bit about the history of DNA sequencing. It's come a long way since it was first um, used. So DNA sequencing, uh, back in the late 1960s and early 1970s, when it was first really becoming a technique that was used in uh, labs, uh, in, in those times, we were only able to sequence about 100 nucleotides per year. So if we think about how much time it would take to sequence our human genome of 3 billion nucleotides at that rate, it would take about 30 million years. So obviously, it did not take that long. Um, we have made many technological advances. And now, in 2012, it takes one day to sequence <coughs> an entire human genome, which is pretty incredible. And so really, the reason behind this is because in 1970, all of this work was done by hand. It was a very slow um, process, and it was just not very efficient. But in 2012, we have automated sequencing machines, um, like the ones you'll see later if you come on our lab tour. Um, and these machines are able to process the sequencing very quickly and able to look at um, the sequencing at, of many pieces of DNA at one time instead of just one strand, which is what was looked at back in 1970. So with this increase in technology, there's been a huge decrease in the cost to sequence one genome. So if you look at the green line in this graph, um, it's showing the cost to sequence one genome from 2001 to 2012. And you can see back in 2001, it was about $100 million to sequence one genome. 
And now in 2012, we're below $10,000 to sequence one genome. And so if things continue at the rate they've been going, it will be very um, soon that we may all be able to afford our whole genome sequencing. Okay. So let's talk about the principles that are used um, in the DNA sequencing process. So we use DNA replication, the normal process that happens in cells, um, for sequencing. So I already told you that DNA is a double-stranded molecule, and when DNA is replicated, the strands separate, and the new strand um, is formed based on the template that the old strand um, is giving. So each nucleotide in the new strand is going to pair to one in the old strand. And during sequencing, we can actually spy on which nucleotide is added to the new strand in order, um, in real time, as this is occurring. So we'll do a little cartoon demonstration of how this is working. So here's our double-stranded DNA. It's going to open up so that we have each individual strands. And then machinery in the cell called DNA polymerase is going to come in and read the sequence uh, of our template strand here, uh, and it will help incorporate the new nucleotides to match. So here we have our DNA polymerase that's reading through our template, and it's added a new strand that matches our old strand. Okay. So what's the process of DNA sequencing? A patient would give a biological sample to be sequenced. And this might be blood or a saliva sample or maybe even a piece of a tumor that you would like to sequence. Once we get the sample, DNA is going to be isolated from these cells. And then the DNA is chopped up into very small pieces. Um, this is because the DNA sequencing reaction um, is much easier to do and works much better on short pieces of DNA. Once we have our short pieces of DNA, we attach them to a glass slide, which I've depicted here. And so you can imagine that in each spot of this slide is a short piece of DNA that's just sort of hanging off the slide. Um, this is an oversimplification. There are many, many more spots than this on a glass slide. OK, so how do we actually detect the nucleotide sequence? We'll use our piece of DNA here as an example. So we've added our DNA polymerase to help us with this reaction. And then we add um, one type of nucleotide at a time. Um, and each nucleotide is going to be tagged with a little fluorescent molecule. So when it actually can go, um, when it gets incorporated into the new strand, it will give off light um, from this molecule. So we'll use an example here where we're introducing uh, the nucleotide T. So we wash that over our whole glass slide. And then if the polymerase can incorporate that into our new strand, um, we'll get a little bit of light released. And inside the machine, we have a detector that can read this light coming off of our new strand. Um, and it converts that to a graph in which we have a peak for every time a specific nucleotide is added. And so I said this is happening at um, many sites on this glass slide at one time. So what we're really seeing inside the machine are basically just little spots where at each of these sites a T was incorporated. So we repeat this cycle um, with all of the different nucleotides over and over again until we can complete our sequence. Okay. So once we have our sequencing reaction finished, this is the output that we get. So we'll just get a bunch of these nucleotide peaks, um, and we can read our sequence from that. So what do we have to do? The first thing is, since we cut apart our DNA, we're going to have to piece those um, little fragments of DNA back together. So that's a big challenge, piecing them back together. The other thing we have to do is align that to the reference genome. So we have to try and match that together so that we can see whether there were any changes in our sequence. So this is all very difficult. It takes a lot of computing power to do this. But let's think um, about our example DNA sequence here. Let's say 
um, our patient came in, and, and this was a, se a sequence that popped out of the machine. Um, one thing that we might be worried about is that, okay, maybe there's certain um, single nucleotide polymorphisms in this sequence. So will we still be able to match this to the reference genome if it's not exactly alike? And the answer is yes. You can think that about this um, like a search engine. So if you typed into a search engine, reference genome, but you misspelled one letter. So you put an I here instead of an E. Uh, the search engine would be able to go and look at its reference word bank and try and figure out what's the closest match. So they might return, did you mean reference genome with an E? And so it's been able to match it, and it actually does recognize that you made a one-letter uh, spelling mistake. So that's the same thing that we're doing in our computers to match up with the reference genome. So we can align our um, DNA sequence with the reference genome, and then we can also tell whether there's an error made in our sequence. So once our whole genome uh, is aligned to the reference, we can compare all the changes. And we'll hear more about this um, in Claire's talk later. But I just wanted to bring up that it's up to doctors and scientists to now try and figure out which of these changes are meaningful. Um, as we discussed, some of our changes are um, not detrimental to our health at all. So um, we definitely need to do a lot more research to figure out exactly which ones are going to have an influence on our health. OK. So um, tonight, we learned about how pieces of DNA called genes encode for specific proteins, but most of the genome is actually non-coding. Um, second, changes in DNA can alter proteins, or they might be silent mutations. And then finally, DNA sequencing uses the normal process of DNA re replication that's found in cells to determine the order of nucleotides in a DNA sample. Okay, so um, up next we'll have Claire who will tell us about diagnosis and prevention of disease using the technologies that we just learned about. Um, but does anybody have any questions before we move on? Yeah, right here. Um, okay, so the question was, are the SNPs the basis for forensic identification of individuals? Um, I don't think they're being used very much now. Potentially in the future that could be used, um, but I, I don't think that's being used now. I have a question from Jean in Boston um, about the reference genome. <laughs> I have a feeling it's an alias. Um, do reference genomes include junk DNA? Uh, yes. So the reference genomes are um, generally going to be whole genome sequencing, so they would include everything. OK. Um, so right here. Hmm. I don't know. I don't think that's been done, um, to my knowledge. Oh, sorry. I keep forgetting to repeat the question. Um, so if you did a whole genome sequence on a newborn and then compared a whole genome sequence in that same individual when they're, when they're 90 years old, um, what would be the differences between them? Um, there likely would be some differences um, that could accumulate over time. Um, however, yeah, I don't think that study has really been done yet, so it would be hard to say. Yeah, and it would also depend on what cell type you're looking at. Um, some cells like are, um, are replaced more often, so they are sort of younger in some sense uh, and might not accumulate as many mutations over time. Um, so yeah, it would depend on the cell, but that would be an interesting experiment to do. One more question? 
Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. In, in the sequence that you show, the, I can see where that gives you, you know, what, what, you know, what, uh, the, how does it know the sequence that it's in? How does that, you, you know, you get so many P's, so many G's, but how do you know what, what order it is? What order they're in. Right, so when we're doing the sequencing, um, so the question was, uh, when you're looking at these diagrams of the peaks that come out of the sequencer, how do you know what order they're in? And so since we're actually replicating the process that's going on in cells using DNA replication, um, we're essentially watching it happen in order. So once we see those peaks come up, we know that that was actually the order that those nucleotides were incorporated into the new strand. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so I think we have to move on to the next section, um, but definitely come up and ask the rest of your questions at the break. That thing doesn't work. Okay, can you all hear me? Okay, good. Um, so my name is Claire Malone, and I'm going to be doing the next section of the talk, which will be talking about how these techniques, this technique that Adriana just described for us, can actually be used um, in healthcare, especially in improving the diagnosis and prevention of human diseases. So I'm going to break my talk up into three sections. So first, we're going to talk about the different um, types of DNA sequencing tests that can be performed in the clinic. Then we're going to talk about how we can apply these um, sequencing information in the diagnosis and detection of disease. And finally, we'll talk about using genetic information to assess fa um, risk factors of disease. So first, we're going to talk about the different types of genetic testing that can be performed in the clinic. And we're going to start with a very focused type of genetic testing and move to a broader and more unbiased types of genetic testing. So this first type of testing um, is called single gene testing. And this is probably what all of you are the most familiar with um, because it's the most common type of testing that's actually being performed in the clinics right now. And in this case, we just sequence one single gene out of all of our DNA, so right here. So we would do this um, in the case of a disease such as hemophilia, where we know what gene can cause hemophilia. So hemophilia is a blood disorder that's characterized by an inability of the blood to clot. And so people who have hemophilia tend to have excessive bleeding. And so when a patient has excessive bleeding, we would know to look for a mutation in the hemophilia gene. And so we would ignore all the rest of the DNA and just focus on that one gene. Another reason we might want to sequence a specific gene like this is, for instance, with hemophilia, if you happen to be in Queen Victoria's family. So Queen Victoria's family notoriously had quite a bit of hemophilia. Um, and so when there's a family history of something, we'll often sequence a specific gene to look and see if uh, that person is affected. So single gene testing is incredibly useful, and it's frequently used in the clinic, but it does rely on clues from symptoms and family history. So you really need to have a suspicion that a certain gene is involved in order to do this type of testing. So the next type of testing we're going to talk about is single nucleotide polymorphism analysis, or SNP analysis. So this gets back to the SNPs that Adriana described, which once again is just a single base pair or nucleotide change in your genetic sequence. So for example, an A switching to a C. And so these single changes actually account for about 80% of our genetic diversity throughout our genomes. And so by looking just at these changes, you can actually get quite a bit of information. So you can sequence a specific SNP if you know that that SNP might be involved in a disease, or you can do genome-wide SNP analysis and look at anywhere from 70,000 to 1 million SNPs. And this is the type of analysis that is actually frequently used in genealogical analyses. Um, and additionally, many of you may have heard of companies such as 23andMe that offer direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So you can send in your saliva, and for a fee, they will tell you all sorts of stuff about your genetic material. And this is the type of analysis that they are doing. Um, so the next type of analysis we're going to talk about is called exome sequencing. So in this type of sequencing, we sequence every gene and we sequence the entirety of every gene, but we skip all of the junk DNA. So this is nice because you don't need to know what gene you're looking for before you do the sequencing analysis. 
So this is helpful in cases where we don't have family history or symptoms that are clear cut to really rely on. Um, but the problem, um, but it, and it, but it's faster and cheaper than sequencing everything because, as Adriana mentioned, only two percent of our DNA actually codes for proteins. So by ignoring the ninety-eight percent of our DNA that has nothing to do with protein coding, we can really narrow down our search. But there's another type of sequencing where we can include this um, so-called junk DNA, and this type of sequencing is called whole genome sequencing. So in whole genome sequencing, we sequence everything. We sequence all three billion nucleotides. And this allows us to have all of the information. And so one reason we might be interested in doing this is that it turns out that the junk DNA, or the non-coding DNA, actually might be really important in certain human disorders. So by immediately eliminating it, we might be overlooking some really important information. And particularly, as we learn more and more about what this genetic information can encode, we're learning more and more about the junk DNA. So this opens up the possibility that in the future, there will be more information about this, um, material, about this junk DNA. And if we've already sequenced it, we can learn more about it from that. So I will pause here to see if anyone has questions about these four different approaches to sequencing. Um, sure. Thank you. So what is referred to as what's next? Okay, um, so the question is what's next gen sequencing compared to these approaches? So, next generation sequencing actually refers to the way that we do the sequencing, not necessarily what we're sequencing. And so, Adriana described one type of next generation sequencing. So, earlier sequencing techniques were much more involved, required much more hands on material. And so, that's really the distinction we're making. So, the way that say whole genome or whole exome sequencing is done would be using a next generation sequencing platform. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just the type of machine that's doing it. And so that's the reason for the precipitous drop in cost is that we found next generation sequencing. Uh, sure. Yep. Is the exome sequencing done based on the messenger RNA or is it like how are you No, okay, yeah, so good question. So the question is, is the exome sequencing done based on the messenger RNA? So no, we're actually sequencing the DNA. We're not sequencing the RNA, but we're just we um, know the regions that code for proteins. Um, they're the same in all individuals. It's just what the code is that might be slightly different. So we can just focus in on those specific areas. So when we chop off the DNA, we can just chop out the actual genes we want to look at. So, but we are looking at the actual DNA in the cell and not the RNA. Yeah. I'll take one more. So those are actually the same. So the question was, what's the difference between doing the single nucleotide versus the polymorphism? So those are actually the same. Um, so it's a single nucleotide polymorphism. So that's one single nucleotide change. So that's one t one approach where you just look at the one nucleotide and skip the information between. So it's one approach. There's not a distinction between those two. You mean between single gene and SNP sequencing? Mm -hmm. No, that's the same method as the, it's single nucleotide polymorphism is the method. Okay, um, so I'll move on. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about how we can apply these different sequencing techniques um, in the actual diagnosis and detection of disease. So we're going to return to the story of Nick that Adriana brought up. So Nick, um, as a young child, as you recall, presented with a very severe bowel syndrome. And unfortunately, throughout several years of trying to receive treatments for this, they were unable to come to a conclusive diagnosis for what Nick had. And so doctors started looking for a genetic cause of his problems due to the really early age of onset and also the, the severity of disease. So this really suggested that there was something genetically uh, right. And so they started looking for single genes that might have been associated with severe bowel disorders. So they did a number of single gene tests, and all of them came back negative. All of his genes that were associated with bowel disorders were normal. And so the next approach was to move on to exome sequencing. Since they couldn't pick a candidate gene, they decided to look at all the genes. So they did exome sequencing on Nick, and they found 16,142 genetic variations between Nick and the reference genome. 
So this sounds like a lot of variations that Nick has. But in actuality, we would expect, just by sequencing anyone in this room, about 20,000 variations. So he's a little bit under average. But that still presents an enormous problem, which is how do you figure out which one of these changes is actually the important one that's causing his severe bowel symptoms. So I'm going to take you through how the scientists and doctors that were working with Nick decided to do this. So they started with the 16,142. And as a first step, they decided to eliminate all of the silent mutations. So this makes sense, right? They eliminated any changes in DNA that are not affecting the protein that gets made, because those changes in DNA would not be expected to cause any difference in the way the proteins function. So they were able to narrow it down to 7,100 of every gene. So they eliminated any of the changes where there was only a change in one of the copies and not the other copy. And that got them down to 70 genes. And so from there, they had to think about which of these changes are really going to be problematic and which ones won't. So if you think about the way that the uh, genetic code works, it tells you which amino acid to add, right? And some of the amino acids are much more similar to each other than other amino acids. So if you, add an, if you make a mistake, but it tells you to add an amino acid that's relatively similar to the one you were supposed to add, you can imagine that the change might not be as bad for the protein function as if the change tells you to add an amino acid that is completely different from the one that was supposed to be there. So they were able to eliminate any of these sort of slight changes in building blocks. And that got them down to eight potential genetic variations. And from there, they looked for variations that were in genes that are really not sites of very much variation throughout the population. So they're pretty much the same in everybody. And the reason they chose genes like that is that the fact that there's not a lot of variation suggests that the function is really, really critical to human survival. And so when there's a change, it's not well tolerated. And that's why we kind of all have the same sequence. So by eliminating all of those, they got down to one single G to A substitution. And so in Leah's portion of the talk, she's going to pick this story up and explain how they verify that this change really was causing um, a disease in Nick and how this changed the way that they treated him and allowed them to effectively treat him. Um, but unfortunately, Nick is not alone. So there are a large number of people who actually are living with undiagnosed diseases. And for this reason, the National Institute of Health um, started, I think, four years ago, the Undiagnosed Diseases Project, which is also often called the Clinic of Last Resort. And so this is intended for patients like Nick, who have been living for a while with these very severe disorders, and no one can diagnose them, usually because the presentation of symptoms is very unusual, or else because the disease itself is so incredibly rare. And so at the Clinic of Last Resort, they do a lot of SNP analyses to try and help diagnose these patients. Um, and so in the first two years of this project, they were successfully able to diagnose 39 patients. And they actually discovered two novel genetic disorders through this project that they were then able to diagnose these patients with. Um, and then additionally, when they can't find anything with SNPs, they, can perform, they do perform exome analyses and whole genome sequencing as a backup. Um, and another place where we're starting to see the use of larger scale genome sequencing in the clinic is in the neonatal intensive care unit. So about a third of the infants that are admitted to the NICU are there because they have some kind of a genetic disorder. But there are over 3,500 known genetic disorders. And in infants, frequently the symptoms are not that specific to the disorder that they have. So a lot of the really obvious symptoms that can tell you what gene to look for don't occur until later in life. So it can be very difficult to come up with a candidate gene approach in the neonatal intensive care unit in the absence of a family history. And so this is one reason that they decided that maybe whole genome sequencing would be a good approach in the neonatal intensive care um, unit. And so Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City has started a pilot program looking at using whole genome sequencing and diagnostics in the NICU. And they can now sequence the entire genome of these infants for about $7,000. So while that's still quite expensive, compared to the cost of stay in the NICU, this is only about two or three days of staying in the NICU. So if they can shorten the infant's stay by effectively diagnosing them much sooner, um, it actually ends up being cost effective. And additionally, and this is quite important for a lot of these infants, they can go from blood sample to diagnosis in 50 hours. And so in a lot of these cases, early intervention can be very important. 
Um, and so this allows them to diagnose these infants within 50 hours, whereas round after round of single gene testing would take much longer. So this really allows a quick diagnosis and coverage of all genetic disorders. So this is kind of the first place um, where we could see whole genome sequencing being used on a more regular basis in the actual clinics today. Um, but so far, we've been talking about diagnosing diseases after symptoms arise. But ideally, we'd really like to be able to detect diseases before those symptoms arise. And in some disorders, early detection is extremely critical. So probably most of you at some point have seen on a food label this warning for phenylketonurix that says contains phenylalanine. And so phenylketonuria is a disease where people don't have the correct enzyme that can digest phenylalanine, which is a normal amino acid that's found in foods and drinks that we all consume all the time. So most people are perfectly fine at digesting this. We have no problems. But people with phenylketonuria cannot digest it at all, and so it just builds up in their bodies. And this causes really severe cognitive defects and can um, shorten lifespan by quite a bit. But, um, and it's a fairly common disorder, occurring about one in every 15,000 births in the United States. But the good news is that with early intervention, all of these um, symptoms of phenylketonuria can be completely avoided. And so these people can have totally normal lifespans and no cognitive disabilities. And the way that they can do this is by following a phenylalanine-free diet from birth. But generally, by the time that symptoms occur, it's too late and the buildup of phenylalanine in the body is already too great. And so actually, anyone in this room who was born in the state of Massachusetts in the last 50 years has been tested for phenylketonuria. And this is because we do newborn screening. So you were tested for phenylketonuria probably before you were released from the hospital. And in addition, Massachusetts actually screens for 29 other common genetic disorders. And this is, um, these are all disorders where early intervention is really critical. So these are 30 different tests that we perform, and it costs about $68. And it's done, as you can see here, they just prick the heel of the infant and take a dried blood spot. And so that's how these um, tests are performed. And they're covered by insurance. It's, it's a standard thing. But what we can imagine is that sometime in the near future, and I don't want to predict when, but it will become technologically and economically feasible to replace newborn screening with whole genome sequencing, which would give us the ability to detect all genetic disorders, not just these 30 common genetic disorders, um, with one test. So I will stop there and take any questions that people may have. Sure, yes. In the case of Nick, uh, what is the yeah, so the question is, in the case of the infants, would it make sense to use the parent's genome instead of the reference genome? So there would be expected to be fewer variations, of course, between the parent's genome and the infant's genome. The problem is that the change that might be causing the disorder probably came from the parents. And so you might not pick that change up if um, the parent has it. So and especially, so often, you know, the parents each have one copy that's not OK and the other copy that's OK. But if they both pass down the bad copy, the disease will occur in the infant, even though both parents are unaffected. But when you align the infant's uh, genetic information to their parents' information, you might miss that change. So there would be fewer, fewer variations, but you also might lose what you're actually looking for. So they'll generally align this to a reference genome. Yeah? Is what companies like Sorry, what? Is what those companies are doing the same kind of thing as the test that you just described that's done? On newborns. OK. Um, so the question is, is what the companies like 23andMe, the direct consumer companies, are doing, is that kind of just a more broad version of the newborn tests? So the newborn tests are actually not um, sequencing any DNA. Um, they're actually looking at the, the, the effect of having the disorder. So they like test whether you're 
um, the, gene, the protein that degrades phenylalanine is working. So most of them, with I think the exception of the cystic fibrosis test, the, like the backup test is genetic sequencing, but most of them aren't actually sequencing DNA. And 23andMe is looking just at those single nucleotide polymorphisms, and in most cases, those aren't necessarily responsible for a disorder, but they can be. Some of them are. So, but if there are other genetic variations that can cause diseases other than single nucleotide polymorphisms, and they would not pick up on those. Uh, sure, one more. Um, the results of finding out about the future diseases that you might get impact your future health insurance coverage and that kind of thing. Yeah, so that's a good question. The question was about um, how this information might impact your future health insurance coverage if you find out that you're going to get a genetic disease. So um, first of all, there are obviously a lot of ethical concerns related with all of this, and we really want to focus on the science tonight. But um, there is a Genetic Non-Discrimination Act that's been passed by Congress that prohibits exactly that, so you're not allowed to um, refuse health care to someone who is currently a healthy individual but whose genetic information suggests that they will later get a disease. So that has been passed, I think it was 2008, 2008 we passed that, kind of predicting that this might become a problem in the future. So, um, so I think I'll move on but I can take more questions um, in a little bit. Um, okay, so so far, we've really been talking about these kind of serious single gene disorders that cause really severe um, problems. But probably the more relevant thing for most people in this room um, is the ability of our DNA to assess our risk of developing some type of a disease later in lifetime. And so we're going to talk about that now. So, so far, we've really been talking about disorders that are encoded by your DNA and have nothing to do with environment. But for the most part, most of our, our um, diseases and our um, traits are due to an interaction between genes and environment. So we often call this nature and nurture. So something that's completely encoded by your DNA and is entirely due to nature is something like your blood type. So my blood type is my blood type, regardless of what country I was raised in or if I am a smoker or not a smoker or how often I exercise. That doesn't change. And something that's completely nurture and has nothing to do with my genetic material is the language that I speak. So regardless of what my DNA says, if I were born in Mexico, I'd be speaking Spanish because that's what I would have learned. But these are kind of rare examples. And the more common example is something that relies on both of these facts. And so one example of this is height. So your height is partially encoded by your DNA. Your parents' height has something to do with it. But it also has a lot to do with your nutrition growing up, things like that. Picky eaters tend to be shorter. And so it's also partially environmental. And so for the most part, most common diseases that we think about often are a result of this interaction. So diabetes, heart disease, things like this are really a result of the complex interaction between your genetic material and your environment. And so we um, call the genetic information that boosts your risk of developing one of these disorders but doesn't dictate that you will get it a risk factor. So how do we identify a genetic risk factor? We usually break it down by looking at individuals' genetic material in two populations. So one would be a group of people who have a disease, and one would be the people without a disease. And in this case, the yellow starburst probably isn't a risk factor for disease because it's occurring at the same frequency in people who have the disease and people who don't have the disease. But if we look at this red starburst, we see that more people who have the disease also have the red starburst. So this suggests to us that they have some kind of increased risk of developing the disease over the patients who don't have the red starburst. However, you'll notice that there are still some people who have this risk factor who don't develop the disease. And additionally, there are people who develop the disease who don't have the risk factor. So it's not in any way a guarantee. And in most cases, this will only boost your chance by a few percentage points. But one genetic risk factor that probably many of you have heard of is the BRCA1 mutation. And if you came to the DNA repair lecture earlier in this series, you would have learned quite a bit about BRCA1. But BRCA1 has an important role in breast cancer. And so women who don't have a muta this mutation in BRCA1 have about a 12% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. Whereas women who do have a mutation in BRCA1 have about a 60% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. So this really boosts their risk of developing this disease. Although there are certainly women who 
have the BRCA1 mutation who never develop breast cancer. Um, but this does allow for certain interventions on the, on the um, part of the doctor when they learn that a woman has BRCA1. So you can have increased surveillance starting mammograms at a much earlier age. And some women even um, choose to have their breast tissue removed in order to prevent future cancers. So this information can be very useful for clinicians. But most diseases are not just, um, the risk isn't increased by just one genetic variation. And they're usually the result of many genes as well as environmental factors. So one example of this is type 2 diabetes. So we've found about 40 different genetic variations that are associated with type 2 diabetes. And so this risk, combined with the environmental factors, such as diet and exercise and body mass index, come together to affect whether or not you'll actually develop the disease. And so for these risk factors, each variation actually only increases an individual's lifetime risk by maybe 1 or 2 percent. They don't dramatically change your future risk of developing diabetes. So it's looking at the the large number of variations where you can start to get a general sense for the risk. But even so, clinical factors are still better at predicting risk of developing type 2 diabetes right now than genetic factors are. And one of the reasons for this is what we call the heritability gap. So we know that about 60 percent of an individual's lifetime risk of developing diabetes comes from environmental factors. And about 40 percent, right here in the red, comes from genetic factors. And we know this from studying families where type 2 diabetes is common, or from twin studies, things like that. But of this whole genetic, this red genetic bar, right now with the 40 genetic variations we know, we can only explain a small portion of that heritability. So about 11 percent of your total risk of type 2 diabetes can be explained by the 40 um, risk factors that we've found so far. So what this tells us is that there's still a lot of information out there that we don't fully understand about our DNA. We're still missing a huge chunk of what our DNA is telling us about our future um, chances of developing a disease. But it also tells us that once we fully understand our genetic material, we will be able to explain probably 40 percent of your chance of developing type 2 diabetes. And in a disease like this where lifestyle um, factors can really impact the development of the, the disease. This can alter the way that patients and doctors um, try and prevent the disease. So patients who know they have a high risk of type 2 diabetes might be a little bit more motivated to make sure that they follow a diet and exercise that will help prevent this disease. Um, so, so far tonight in my talk, well, in my talk, um, I hope that what you've taken away is that these new genetic techniques um, are allowing a whole host of ways that we can start to improve patient care. And so one way is to improve the diagnosis of people who have really unusual symptoms or rare diseases. Um, another way we might be able to use this genetic information to improve this is by detecting these diseases much earlier and before symptoms onset. And finally, we can sometime in the future use this genetic information for risk assessment of these more complex diseases such as type 2 diabetes. So does anyone have any questions? Um, I'll go with him because you haven't asked one yet. Uh, retrospectively, uh, this is basically prospective. If someone is diagnosed with a, a rare form of cancer, what, how would you think about using the techniques that you've described tonight to figure out why that rare form of cancer came to affect that? Um, so, OK, so the question is, retrospectively, you know, we're all here I'm predicting the future of disease. But how would you, if someone's diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, use these genetic tools to figure out how that disease came to be? Um, so that's something that's done quite a bit in the research community. You know, I was focusing on how we're helping patients. That's future helping patients, but scientists focus on that actually probably more than most of these things. And so probably the, the best approach in that case would be you would take the genetic information from the tissue where the rare cancer is, and then you would take another sample from the same patient that's in a tissue that's unaffected, and you would compare the differences there. So you're really going to limit um, kind of the population-wide variation that way and really look at the changes that happened in the cancer. But even there, there's, um, you're going to end up with a lot of changes. Cancer is notoriously um, very heterogeneous in its genetic material. Um, and so then they kind of have to narrow it down um, by using candidate gene approaches, things like that. But Okay. 
Okay, so the question is, would it be helpful if you got a significant um, DNA from parents and children and things like that? Not really, because if they, unless they have the cancer. What would be more helpful would be to collect a lot of pairs of tissue like that from patients that have the same rare cancer. So the best way to do it would be to have a significant number of patients with their normal tissue and their mismatched tissue and look for changes that occur again and again and again. Because the, the um, relatives would really just give you more information about the normal and you're really interested in the abnormal. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. Uh, first, a comment. You speak more directly in the microphone. You want to pick up. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So yeah, so the question is, how do we know the heritability? That was actually in the type two diabetes, not breast cancer. Um, how do we know that there's a forty percent heritability of type two diabetes if we can only explain? 11% of the total heritability by genetic factors. So we know that by studying families and twins that have type 2 diabetes and looking at how that increases the, the next person's risk of getting type 2 diabetes. So comparing, for instance, identical twins versus twins that came from separate um, eggs, we can look at how you know an identical twin is 40% more likely to get type 2 diabetes because they have the same DNA as their twin. So we know that from that, but we can't pinpoint what changes in their DNA was actually causing it. Uh, sure. So since cells So the question is, um, since there are so many changes occurring in your DNA throughout your lifetime, how can we ever really assume that one sequence is actually your normal sequence versus the others? So the way this sequencing is done, we're not looking at just one cell. Usually they collect, you know, I think for 23andMe, they want two and a half milliliters of your saliva. So it's quite a bit of genetic material that they're actually analyzing. And then the second part of that is that they try and get high coverage, is what they call it. So they try and really sequence it multiple times. And so the chances are maybe there's one cell that has a C instead of a T somewhere. But most of the cells around it won't have that same change. They'll have the normal sequence, and maybe they have a change somewhere else. So it's unlikely that all of the cells in your saliva sample will have the same changes. And so by doing that, they can kind of get a better sense of what your normal sequence is. But of course, you're right that most, by the, especially as you get older, most of your cells in your body are going to be slightly different from each other. Oh, one more. Okay. So, okay, so examples of accidental mutations. So, do you want, um, so in the one case, um, it can happen from just normal cellular division. So your cells are always growing to replace old tissues that have been destroyed or as, you know, um, you know, things like your blood replenish frequently, stuff like that, um, your colon tissue. And so at, every time a cell replicates, it makes a new copy, a new master copy of DNA for the new cell. And so that replication machinery often makes mistakes. And so they'll put the wrong base pair in. And there's a lot of ways to protect against that, that try and fix that. So that was, we had a lecture on that earlier in the series. Um, but it's not perfect. And so throughout your lifetime, there are going to be mistakes like that. Another way, though, is the more environmental um, factors. So for instance, UV light causes two, base, uh, two nucleotides to kind of fuse together. And that really bothers the cell when it tries to divide. And so the way they fix that is they kind of cut it out. And so they often put back the wrong bases there. Um, so that's another mechanism of how these mutations can arise. Um, but there's all different, you know, radiation, things like that. Um, 
there's a, your DNA is under constant assault and your body is constantly trying to protect it. Is diet a big factor? So it can be, um, so it's not probably the largest factor except for like tissue in your digestive tract. It's not going to really impact other areas, but certainly diet can change your risk of developing something like colon cancer. Um, so a lot of, so charred food actually is, can have some carcinogenic effects. Um, it's not the biggest factor, you know, it's not like because you ate a lot of barbecue, you're definitely getting cancer or anything like that. But it can, but it can uh, slightly increase your risk. So we'll take a break now, right? Okay. Okay, so we're going to take a five minute break right now. During this time, please bring any additional questions down front. All three of our speakers will be standing up here to answer any questions they didn't get to. Um, we'll meet back here in about five minutes, and if you don't have a survey or if you need a pen to fill out your survey, please grab one up here so you're ready to hand it in right at the end of the talk.
Hi guys, we're going to get started again in just about a minute or two, so if you still have questions, bring them down at the end and we'll be happy to answer them, but try to head back to your seats. Okay, we're going to get started with the third part of tonight's talk uh, with Leah Liu, again, a graduate student here at Harvard Medical School. A few very quick reminders. Our next Science in the News events are listed at the end of your handout. Uh, we don't have any more seminars in this specific series, but as we said at the beginning, there will be a series again in the spring. The format will be a little bit different. It will be a little more focused on individual research as opposed to the broader overview. But the next Science in the News event is Science by the Pint on December 10th. Our advertisements are down front with the schedule for November, December, and January right here. Uh, the next one is Dr. Seth Lloyd from MIT. He studies quantum communicating, qu uh, sorry, quantum computing, the universe, and the bit. So we hope to see some of you again there. And again, at the end of the talk, if you have any more questions, just bring them down front. We'll be down here for about 10 minutes before the lab tour. Right. Can everyone hear me? All right. OK, great. Welcome back from the break. Uh, before the break, Claire talked about the applications of personalized medicine for predicting and diagnosing diseases, and how personalized medicine can answer questions like, what is the mutation causing my symptoms, or what is my risk for the disease? But after making a diagnosis, personalized medicine can also inform how we treat patients. And so that's what I'll be talking about in my portion of this talk. So we know from previous, um, previous talks that single gene testing is a form of personalized medicine, too. And we're now able to use single gene testing for certain genes or medicines that can answer questions like, what treatment is most effective, what dose works the best, or what treatment has the fewest side effects. Um, using whole genome and exome sequencing is still a relatively new concept, but um, it can be used to answer these questions too. And I'll be giving an exome sequencing example when I finish the story about Nick, um, the two-year-old boy who had the um, very severe bowel disease. So medicines are not equally effective in all patients. A given medicine may not work as well for me as it does for you, or I might have different side effects compared to you. Uh, this is a graph of several, different, several popular classes of medicines and the percentage of patients that respond well to treatment. And for example, most cancer and Alzheimer's disease treatments work in less than half of the patients. And even for asthma drugs, 
only 60% of patients respond well to them. So for a lot of diseases, it appears that different people might require different treatments, but how do we figure out which ones to give to them? So scientists know that genetics, um, the genetic differences can account for some of these differences, and we're beginning to learn a lot more about the genetics behind how, how well patients respond to therapy. And I'll be going over some examples um, in my talk. So in Adriana's portion of the lecture, she um, talked about how many diseases are caused by mutations in DNA that can lead to the formation of a mutated protein. And these mutated proteins can often interfere with normal cellular processes. For example, a certain mutated protein might increase cell division such that a tumor can form. Um, a term you may have heard in the news is a targeted therapy. And targeted therapies have been successful mostly in the cancer field. And this type of therapy works by um, attacking the specific mutation that's responsible for the disease. Targeted therapies bind and inhibit, the, um, they bind the shape of the mutated protein, but can't bind to the shape of a normal unmutated protein. So this is kind of like a lock that, or a key that can only fit into a certain type of lock. And I'll be giving a concrete example in a little bit. In contrast, um, a standard therapy that's used for cancer is chemotherapy, and this works very differently from targeted therapies. Chemotherapy is a generalized therapy, and it attacks all dividing cells, but this also means that it can attack normally dividing cells too, which isn't ideal, and this can lead to a lot of side effects. Um, in theory, th targeted therapies will lead to fewer side effects because the normal cells are not affected. For a targeted therapy to work, um, it has to be highly specific. But, different, but mutations in different genes can cause the same disease. And in this example here, we have three people who might have melanoma, which is a type of skin cancer. But they have three different mutations in three different proteins. And this is possible because there are many proteins in our cells that perform the same functions. So mutations in uh, multiple proteins can lead to the same outcome. So before, before deciding to use a targeted therapy, patients must be tested for their mutation to make sure that the targeted therapy is compatible. So now let's talk about um, a real example for melanoma. BRAF is the name of a protein that's mutated in about 60% of melanomas. This type of mutation is not inherited. Uh, people are not born with it, but they usually acquire this mutation later on in life. And melanoma is a type of skin cancer that doesn't normally res uh, respond well to chemotherapy or radiation treatment, so there has been a huge need to develop a better therapy. BRAF's normal function in the body is to promote normal cell division in a very controlled way. However, when BRAF is mutated, uh, cell division becomes uncontrollable, kind of like BRAF has no breaks, and this can lead to the for formation of a tumor. Scientists have been able to develop a therapy called bemorafenib, which binds and inhibits to the mutated form of BRAF, but it can't bind um, to the normal form of BRAF because the two have different shapes. So this inhibition prevents overactive cell division, and this leads to the shrinkage of tumors. And the specificity of bemorafenib means that patients have fewer side effects because the normal cells are less likely to be affected. Here's an image from um, the clinical trial when bemorafenib was being tested on melanoma patients. So this is an image of a patient's torso, and the black regions show which tumors are actively dividing. And um, in the before picture, you can see that this patient has a lot of tumors, but after treatment with bemorafenib, you can see that the patient has um, shrinkage of his or her tumors. So bemorafenib has been approved by the FDA for melanoma patients that um, have BRAF mutations. But unfortunately, um, this BRAF inhibitor won't work for the 40% of melanoma patients that don't have BRAF mutations. But on the other hand, BRAF is mutated in other cancers too. So um, bemorafenib is currently in clinical trials for other cancers such as leukemias that, um, that also have BRAF mutations. So um, currently, a lot of targeted therapies exist, um, and here are just a few examples, and most of them are for cancers, such as breast cancer, chronic myelogenous, myelogenous leukemia, and colon cancers, and here are some examples you might have heard of. Um, but recently, um, <clears throat> targeted, therapies for, uh, therapy, targeted therapies for non-cancer diseases are being developed, too. So in this, um, for example, 
there has been a recently approved drug for cystic fibrosis called Ivacaftor. And cystic fibrosis is an inherited lung disease. And this Ivacaftor drug works for cystic fibrosis patients who have a very specific mutation. So in all of these examples, patients need to be attested ahead of time to make sure that the mutation that's causing their disease is compatible with the targeted therapy. So I'm going to stop here for questions. Does anyone have any questions about targeted therapies? In the back? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, for breast cancer, most patients are probably getting tested to see if they have any of the common mutations that are involved in breast cancer. And for something like this, I believe 70% um, no. Oh, 60, it's more than half of breast cancer patients are positive for the estrogen receptor. So they might benefit um, from this type of treatment. Does that answer your question? So you're saying yeah. that they're actually the Right, right. So most people who are diagnosed with breast cancer are being tested. Um, there are several more rare um, mutations that people are tested for that there are targeted therapies for as well. Yes? Mm -hmm. So is the question, how is gene therapy different from a targeted therapy? OK, so in gene therapy, you're actually replacing the DNA. Um, you're replacing the mutated DNA with a copy of the normal DNA or a normal protein. In this example, we're using a type of drug, so a chemical, that can bind to the shape of a mutated protein to stop its function. Yeah. Right, so um, the question is well, um, about resistance. So um, that can occur, and especially in this example that I gave. Uh, after a couple of months, a lot of melanoma patients do develop resistance to this therapy. And scientists have been able to predict where these mut um, resistance mutations are occurring. And we're now able to design drugs that also act on the resistance mutations. So in the future, um, ideally, we'd we would want to give patients maybe a combination therapy to anticipate some of these resistance mutations because in some of the cancers, they tend to be in the same region. All right, so let's move on. All right, so I've shown you that genetics can tell, can tell us if a particular treatment will work for a patient based on their mutations. And now I'm going to be talking about something called pharmacogenetics, which is using genetics to find the best dose of a drug or to, um, to minimize the risk of side effects. So currently, dosing of medicines is based on factors such as your age, your weight, and your gender. And this usually works pretty well for most people. But for some people, even a standard dose will give them a toxic reaction or really bad side effects. And we know that genetics plays into this. So the example I'm going to give is warfarin. Warfarin, or Coumadin, is the most popularly prescribed anticoagulant. So an anticoagulant prevents the formation of blood clots. And a patient would need this if they're at high risk for getting blood clots, for example, if they have an irregular heartbeat or a history of having heart attacks. Um, a protein called VCORC1 is normally involved in promoting clotting, and this is the target for warfarin. So when warfarin binds to VCORC1, this inhibits um, VCORC1's function and decreases clotting. After warfarin acts on its target, it eventually needs to be broken down and excreted, like all medicines need to be metabolized. And, <clears throat> and this is so it's not just circulating in your blood, blood forever. A protein called CYP2C9 is the gene that's responsible for breaking down warfarin. And scientists have been able to discover several variants in VCORC1 and CYP2C9 that impact warfarin's function. And they think that the variants um, in these two genes account for up to 40% of the variation in dose that patients need for warfarin. So the VCORC1 variants lead to lower levels of the protein to begin with. So these patients require lower doses of warfarin. The CYP2C9 variants um, lead to less metabolism and less excretion of warfarin. So warfarin stays circulating in the body longer. So would you guess for, 
to patients who have CYP2C9, um, CYP2C9 variants if, if they would need a higher or a lower dose of warfarin? Who thinks higher? All right, who thinks lower? All right, very good. So these patients require a lower dose of warfarin because having too much warfarin than a patient needs can lead to um, too much action and it increases the risk that patients will have bleeding. So this is what we currently know about the genetics behind the warfarin's function. And it's, it's believed that genetic testing for these variants can decrease thousands of adverse ev events per year due to misdosing mis of warfarin. However, testing for these variants is not very widespread right now. And one of the main reasons is because it takes days or even weeks for single gene testing results to come back. And sometimes doctors don't have that long. They need to treat a patient right away. So in the future, we can imagine that um, our technological capabilities will catch up to our knowledge for this particular example. <clears throat> Another application of pharmacogenetics is to predict the side effects of different medicines. So in this example, I'll be talking about carbamazepine, which is used to treat epilepsy or bipolar disorder. And carbamazepine can impact people who have HLA-B variants. So HLA-B is a type of, is a protein that's involved in the immune system. People who have the common variant of HLA-B are at a very low risk of developing side effects like a skin infection. But people with um, an HLA-B variant that's more rare have a, have a chance of getting a very severe skin infection that can be possibly life-threatening. So it's now recommended that patients of a certain ancestry who are more likely to have this rare variant be tested ahead of time before they go on this type of therapy. So does anyone have any questions about pharmacogenetics? Yes. <laughs> For allergy so um, right now there are actually tests available that um, that track a lot of different types of responses, but I don't think they're very widespread right now because of cost. A lot of these tests aren't covered by insurance, and they, it takes a while for the test results to come back. Yes? So where would you go to get these at the hospital, or at the laboratory, or where does it exist right now? Um, so ideally, um, you'd be going to your doctors to get these the, um, these gene tests. However, um, a lot of times, in the warfarin example, they're not covered by insurance yet, so you probably don't want to spend a lot of money getting your gene tested. Um, but for some genes, there's also consumer kits, but um, those cost a lot of money too. But in the cases of, for example, newborn screening, that's covered by your insurance. Yes. Right, right, yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Move on. All right, let's move on. So now let's transition from talking about single gene testing to whole genome or exome sequencing um, and how to use that as a tool to um, find a treatment for a disease. And this isn't very common yet, mostly due to the cost and our um, ability to handle all that information, but this is very important because genome information can tell us if new mutations or new diseases can be treated with existing treatments, and it can also tell us which genes should be targets for the development of new treatments. So I'm going to pick up on the story of Nick that uh, Adriana and Claire started earlier. Um, Nick had a severe inflammation of his bowels, and Claire went over how scientists were able to use exome sequencing to, um, to figure out what the var gene variations were in his genome and narrow that down to one base pair change that they thought were impacting his symptoms. And this one mutation was in a gene called XIAP. And XIAP is involved in immune system function and preventing apoptosis in the immune system. However, scientists were puzzled because it had never been previously associated with a bowel disease. So the next thing they had to do was actually prove that Nick had a defect, a functional defect in XIAP that were causing his symptoms. So one of the ways they did that was to stimulate a specific response, immune response. And they did that by taking Nick's cells from his body and um, un uninfected cells from the normal patient, and they stimulated a specific immune response. And in the uninfected cells, we got 
scientists were able to observe a response as expected, but in Nick's cells, there was no response. So scientists were able to conclude that Nick had a defective XIAP. Even though XIAP had no previously, um, no previously known links to bowel disease, scientists did know that a deficiency in XIAP can lead to a serious blood disorder. And um, Nick's doctors began to worry that he would eventually have an imbalance in, the, in his immune cells that can be life-threatening. And the typical way to treat this type of imbalance would be to replace his immune system and to replace his blood. And Nick received such a transplant from an anonymous donor, but this, this replacement of his immune system didn't change his genes. It only replaced the cells that were most impacted by his mutation. And amazingly enough, after um, Nick received his transplant, his bowel um, inflammation went away and it has not come back. So this is pretty interesting because this treatment based on exome sequencing was very unexpected because people wouldn't usually think to treat a bowel disease by replacing the immune system or replacing the whole blood system. Sorry. Um, so in this situation, exome sequencing was probably the only way to diagnose Nick's disease. And based on the, this diagnosis, scientists and doctors would be able to figure out the best type of treatment for him. That might not have been very obvious from the beginning. Um, sequencing has many advantages over single gene testing um, when many diseases, for example, share the same symptoms, or in Nick's case, when he had a very unique presentation of the disease. And eventually, uh, sequencing might be cheaper than testing single genes, and it might be faster, too. And for the scientists, sequencing is really exciting because it can lead to the discovery of novel connections in biology. And before Nick's case, scientists didn't know that XIAP had anything to do with the bowel. So now they're able to study this interaction and maybe be able to come up with a faster way to diagnose patients or a better therapy. So to summarize this section, targeted therapies can treat diseases caused by specific mutated proteins. Pharmacogenetics is a concept that involves using genetics to predict the best dosage of a medicine and to minimize side effects. And whole genome and exome sequencing are useful tools to be able to find ways to treat patients. So what might a visit to your doctors look like in the future? Well, today, there are very few examples of doctors using whole genome or exome sequencing in their management of patient care. Um, and also, testing of single genes is still cheaper than sequencing. However, in the near future, we can imagine that um, there might be a $1,000 genome, and this would increase the access of this technology to more people. And because more people will be sequenced in the future, we'll learn a lot more about what these variations between people actually mean for disease risk. So we'll be able to have better diagnosis, detection, and risk assessment. There will probably be more targeted therapies and increased use of pharmacogenetics to help treat patients. In the far future, it's harder to imagine um, it's harder to predict what will happen, but we, can, we might be able to expect lower health care costs across the board. Um, we might actually be able to understand junk DNA better as scientists and learn how junk DNA can uh, contribute to disease. And maybe um, with the technology and the decrease of cost, everyone's genomes might be sequenced as a standard, um, very commonplace um, technique in medical care. So the overarching theme of personalized medicine is prevention of a disease as opposed to a reaction to a disease. And we think that the um, more information about our genome will help us towards this goal. So tonight, Adriana, Claire, and I talked about how personalized medicine uses an individual's genetic characteristics to inform medical care. We also discussed that DNA sequencing is a technology that can be used to find alterations in our DNA that can impact health. And different types of DNA sequencing can be used to diagnose and detect disease diseases, to assess risk factors, and to find ways to treat disease. So I hope some of you will stick around for our lab tour. We'll be touring Steve McCarroll's lab. Um, this lab focuses on, focuses on studying um, human genome variation and, and disease risk. And here's a picture of two of our classmates that are in this lab, uh, Christina and Linda. And they'll be showing you guys some of the sequencers they have in their lab, including this one shown here in this picture, and some of the robots that they use in their experiments. So thank you very much for listening. We'd also like to thank our sponsors. Yes, we'll, we'll take more questions, too. <laughs> yes? Uh, earlier in the evening, you saw that more law in terms of the cost of holding your sequencing was too cheap. Mm -hmm. 
I honestly have no idea. <laughs> so I mean, you can see that the trend is rapid. The, it's it's decreasing at an exponential rate almost. And so I would think in the next maybe five to ten years, we might see a one thousand dollar genome. But other than that, it's it's very hard to predict. Where maybe there will be a new technological breakthrough that could um, even increase the speeds faster. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so in Nick's example, a lot of the techniques that they use to um, the, all the calculations and the computer modeling that they used to narrow down his 16,000 variations down to the one that was causing his mutation, a lot of those were new. Um, so, uh, so those techniques can be applied to other examples of exome sequencing where we're trying to figure out which of the which of the many variations is the one that's causing the disease. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think so. So they actually came up with a list of what 2,000, yeah, 2,006 candidate genes, and XIAP was not on that list at all. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I believe that. So I believe there are um, BCR able mutations in that type of cancer. Correct me if I'm wrong. In gastrointestinal, so it is it is approved by the FDA for um, for that type of cancer, um, and I would believe that it's because it matches the correct mutation. Right, right, it should. Mm -hmm. Because it shouldn't work, a type of therapy, a targeted therapy shouldn't work um, in people who don't have that mutation. Right. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when they do clinical trials, people, the patients are tested first ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, they're still doing trials. So this is just so sequencing will just give you um, data, right? But we actually have to make sure that something will work in a human being. So um, testing clinical trials and testing on humans is still necessary. Yes. Okay. Okay. We will continue taking questions right now. I just know some people need to duck out early, as is apparent. So just make sure you hand in your surveys on your way out. We'll take a few more questions up this way and then you can bring any additional up front. I also just wanted to comment there was some music earlier. I did a little investigative work. There was a seminar in the room before us with some hotshot immunologists and then there was a reception following with a live band. So I apologize. We didn't know about it ahead of time but hopefully it did not impair the lecture too much. Okay back to Leah. So like Claire said earlier, they, use, they look at um, repeated regions in your DNA. So there are some regions in your DNA where there are many different repeats of the same thing, and, but they differ between individuals. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> um, there are, so, so zebrafish um, is something that I use in my research. And we use them because they're a really great model for a lot of human diseases and because we can um, look at them develop in real time. And they're clear and there are a lot of tools available to study. We can talk about this more later. But we're able to model a lot of human diseases in zebrafish. We can do a lot of um, like screening because we can get a lot of numbers 
um, of zebrafish at one time to do experiments on them that we wouldn't be able to do in mice. Well, I, I know the, the, for example, MGH uh, keeps the uh, cancer patients uh, tissue, uh, uh, cancer tissue, like uh, 10 years ago, and they keep it somewhere. What is the use of that in the future, or what is the purpose of the industrial gene keeping that in there? So, um, so the question is, what is the purpose of banking samples for the future? Yeah. So, um, so a lot of the times those are de-identified, so we don't necessarily know whose tissue it is. But that can be tissue like that can be really re useful for research. Um, we might be able to look at it, see what it looks like, sequence it to see what types of mutations are in this type of tissue, and do some experiments with it to learn more about whatever disease that. Um, the tissue came from, but where that was impacting the tissue. Okay, then we thank you all for coming. We hope you enjoyed this seminar and the whole series, um, and we hope to see you, some of you at Science by the Pint on December 10th, and as many of you as enjoy our lectures at um, our spring lecture series in Cambridge. We will be back here, same place, next fall with another nine seminar series. The spring series will be a little different.